Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. And this week, we have a special guest. Charity Wright is with us. She is a threat intelligence expert. And that's something that Adam and I, while we do know a little bit about it, it's certainly not our expertise. And we've talked about different silos of cybersecurity before. And threat intelligence is definitely one very important silo. There are experts like Charity in this field that look at different signals, geopolitical things that are happening, and then aggregate those for cybersecurity professionals to use in different tools and different methods, reports, and stuff like that. So thank you so much for joining us, Charity. If you want to give a little introduction about yourself and your experience before we start for our listeners so that they get an idea of who you are and what your experience is, and then we'll dive right into it. Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, You know, I think, let's see, I've been in cybersecurity for maybe seven or eight years. And before that, I started my career in the US Army. And, uh, you know, I was basically college age, decided to join the Army because a recruiter found me and told me about the Army linguist program. So, you know, here I am, 19, 20 years old, I'm like, take me away from my parents, like, get me out of here. I want something new and refreshing, something fun. Um, And he basically explained that we'll send you to school to learn a foreign language, and then you can go somewhere in the world and meet new people and and help uh, translate that language for various people. Now, at that time, it was 2005, so I assumed I would be learning Arabic and going to Iraq because that's what was happening in the world at that point. Um, But, like, I guess secretly I was hoping I would get something easy, like French or German or even (laughs) Hebrew, like something really fascinating and interesting, uh, maybe an easy duty station. Um, But to my surprise, they assigned me to learn Mandarin Chinese. And uh, my first reaction was, there's no way I can learn Chinese. (laughs) But it was really fun. and, And I spent about a year and a half in language school learning Chinese before I was stationed in Hawaii to work at the National Security Agency. So quite a detour from what I thought the Army was going to do with me. Um, and I didn't yeah. have much of a choice in any of it. So uh, it, it all worked out great. I uh, really enjoyed my time at the NSA. I uh, got to do some cool spy work. And um, that's really where I grew an appreciation for intelligence as a craft. And I fell in love with it. And um, like most things in my life, I wasn't really great at it off the bat. But because of my passion for it, I just kept working really hard at it. And over the years, I just decided I'm going to stick with Chinese, I'm going to stick with China studies. And that's what led me to a career in cyber threat intelligence. Um, and, and that led me into the private sector about seven years ago. And that's where I've been ever since. That's just fascinating. I love hearing about people who are in the military. I'm a veteran myself and there are just so many different jobs that you can have. And I don't know if people are aware that there is a linguistics section within our military and that you can have a career doing translation or even threat intelligence um, and get assigned to like a cool duty station like Hawaii with the NSA. It's really cool. Yeah. I really had no idea before I met that particular recruiter. And and the funny part is, ever since then, like throughout my whole army career, I did five years active and five years in the National Guard. I still have not met another recruiter that knew that we have linguists. <laughs> so wow. it seems like it was ordained. It was meant to be um, <laughs> that that particular recruiter met me on campus at my college. How many were in your class at the school that you went to um we have classes of 20 and they're split into two different classrooms so we have sections of 10 each 
And the Chinese teachers are a team of maybe six um, native speakers, and many of them were professors in China or Taiwan or even southern China, like Hong Kong. Um, and they rotate through the classrooms uh, for different periods. So it's kind of a small group setting. Yeah. I'm, again, fascinated because uh, my parents are from Taiwan, and so they speak Mandarin. And I learned it as a kid, but I never stuck with it. So I probably have like a second grade you know, understanding of it. And it's not easy. I'm just, were there, is there a f high, um, like failure rate? Like do people actually, um, like say, Hey, I'm going to go do something else. This is too hard for me. Yeah. Because, um, you know, many of us in the army, we didn't really get a, a choice in what language we were assigned to. It was based on test scores and, and the test is very, obscure you can't really figure it out it's like coded languages and you're just trying to um figure out the code as you go and then you walk out and you're like well i definitely failed that <laughs> but um <laughs> they assign it to you based on your unique ability to learn certain types of languages so it was really interesting a lot of our class were um linguists that had been in the military for a while and had already learned a, a different language. And so like maybe they knew Korean before or Arabic and they were reclassing to learn a new language and be assigned to a new, um, a new role. So we relied heavily on them for, for guidance on how to navigate the language course, but it was pretty intense, especially because our Chinese teachers really expected a lot of us. It's different from the American school system. Um, and I don't think as American students, we were really used to that. So it was very, very intense, eight to four, Monday through Friday. And that's in addition to, you know, 5 a.m. physical training and after class doing army training, like combat stuff. Um, but the classes themselves were pretty intense. It's three semesters in the first few weeks. Well, the first couple of weeks is really just intro to the language and, you know, to using characters in the language. And um, after that, we weren't allowed to use English in the classroom, which was really challenging because I had oh. only learned Spanish. Uh, That's the only other foreign language I had learned up to that point. And apparently when you tap into that foreign language part of your brain, just whatever you know comes out. So I was just mixing up Mandarin and Spanish all the time. I'm sure my teachers are really frustrated with me. <laughs> but um, I know I wasn't the only one, but um, it was really challenging. And the failure rate for the Chinese course is 50%. So half of the class that you start with, you won't graduate with. Um, so that is extra pressure because you see people struggling and then falling back and they'll give you another chance to roll back to a newer class that's just starting. And they give you a couple chances to start over. But after a few tries, if you're just not getting it, they'll offer for you to um, go to a lower, uh, lower level language. Um, like Chinese is a category four. It's one of the hardest languages to learn for an English speaker. So they will offer you like a category three or two or one. I don't even know what one would be actually, but um, Spanish, uh, Hebrew, Russian, uh, maybe Farsi, Dari, Pashto, languages like that are a little bit easier for English speakers to learn. Um, not that any of them are easy, but learning a foreign language is very challenging. But but Chinese, yes, we um, had a, a very high failure rate. And um, there was a point I really thought I wasn't going to make it. But I, I was like going to like study halls at night, just putting in that extra effort. And I ended up graduating the most improved student. So, I mean, that speaks to how bad I was at one point. <laughs> but but I, I made it through. I passed the the defense language proficiency test, which is you know, the, the final test that, uh, that the course culminates in. So, yeah, I still I know say how I hard that out. is because I, <laughs> I know how hard that is because I, I tried that and I failed it. Um, and I had been, you know, listening and hearing Chinese all my whole life and 
I still wasn't able to pass. It's very difficult. Um, so it's so, kudos to you. So thank you. I was going to say, it's just so important for us to take the test right after class or while we're in it, immersed in it. Because the truth is, they say, like, if you don't use the language, you lose it. And that is the truth. I was going to joke that I don't use my speaking. Um, I don't speak Mandarin enough to really keep up with it. So I'd probably be at a second grade level, too, right now for speaking. (laughs) I can read it pretty well, but speaking it is a little harder. So you went from the Army, and then you also did National Guard, which you did pretty much the same job in the national guard but you also worked a civilian job at the same time because that's how the national guard works for our listeners you have a civilian job and then you usually do your one week in a month two weeks a year type deal um so in your civilian experience like how did you i guess start off as in cyber with this experience in chinese linguistics and your experience at the nsa and kind of your interest and excitement passion for uh, intelligence how did you get into cyber intelligence that way you know my transition into the civilian world was it, it was pretty um unique i guess is that i took a few years off of chinese work i got out of the army because i had babies i had two in a row And my husband at the time was also active duty. He was also a Chinese linguist and he was on submarines. So um, I I got out of the army, out of active duty. I took a few years off. I finished my bachelor's degree when the kids were babies. And then we ended up divorcing. And that was was a pretty tough thing. And, And I bring that up because I know a lot of people go through major challenges and life changes. And I feel like that was the pivotal moment for me where I became a single mom with 24-7 care of my kids. Um, So I moved home to Dallas to be near my family, which is where I am now. And thank God I have my parents here and my brother and sister because I really needed that family support to help me. Um, And when I got here, I was very optimistic, like, okay, let's look for linguist jobs and then i quickly realized there are no government agencies in dallas that need chinese linguists it's just the truth and it was even very difficult to find an intelligence analyst job which is a secondary mos or job that i had in the military it's like you're a linguist you translate but you're also analyzing intelligence and you're like finding those like golden nuggets of truth that are so important um, to understand you know threats. So I was looking for Intel analyst jobs and I came across a role called cyber threat intelligence analyst. And my first thought was, I know nothing about cyber. Like I know minimum on IT. Um, but what do I have to lose? Like I, I need a job. I need a good career. And if it requires me to learn something new, I'm fine with that. Like I can learn Chinese so I can do anything right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's what I was telling myself so I went ahead and just applied for it I also found somebody on LinkedIn that worked at that company in that same position he also was army veteran so kind of made some connections there and said hey how do you think I can get into this role and he gave me some advice like okay you're just starting out so maybe you want to study for security plus certification Um, And that way you kind of get a broad idea of what is going on in cybersecurity right now. Um, And he told me, you've got the Intel experience and you know Chinese, so I think you have a chance. Just be honest with them about what you do have and what you don't have. Um, and, And really, I think that was my key. That was my pivotal moment of getting into cyber as I applied, I stepped out of my comfort zone and I just went for it because at that point I needed to provide for my family and uh, it, it was like a fresh start for me. So I went into that interview very nervous, but I was very honest with them and just laid it all out. I said, here's what I can offer you. Here's what I can help with in the CTI team. Um, if you are patient with me and just give me some opportunities to learn, I will give it 110%. And uh, lucky for me, 
there was a, a Marine gunnery sergeant retired. He was in charge. And a U.S. Army Cyber Command Colonel, who we call Colonel, um, these were the bosses. And so I, nice. I felt like this was, was this was where I was meant to be. And it was a small startup yeah. company here in the Dallas area, but they do secure cloud hosting. So I was able to really cut my teeth on cyber with um, network security and surrounded by people that I felt um, were like brothers. It was a very familiar atmosphere. So that's how um, I got my first cybersecurity job is just kind of sticking my neck out. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, well, I thought it was really interesting. You, you talking about, you know, even many, many years ago, how you use LinkedIn to get to the job. And I just saw an article, I think it was yesterday or today that was saying, even though we're in the middle of the great resignation or the great reshuffle or whatever you want to call it, there are people out there who are saying, I still can't get a job. It's still really, really hard. And, one of the things that organizations apparently are doing now is they're not posting jobs. They're actually more doing it like outbound sales where the recruiters are going out and finding the candidates and bringing them in as opposed to taking applications because it's unmanageable to even take applications now um, in some circumstances. And so they're saying it's more important than ever to have that LinkedIn presence, to be comfortable speaking with recruiters and that sort of thing. And then the other thing you talked about too, that really resonated with me was how, when you went into the interview, how you were really honest about here are my skills and here are my strengths. And here's where I need some, some opportunity to grow into the role. And I will say anecdotally, and the plural of anecdote is not data. I get that. But for me, I had the same experience with some of the best jobs I've ever gotten where when I walked in the interview and I was very, very candid about, I bring a lot of skills to the table. Here's the things I'm really good at. Here's the things I'm going to need some leeway on some runway to get up to speed. And in all the cases where I got the job, it was the right thing because they understood how, what I was coming in with and they understood how that helped me get there. And it was such a better experience. So just thought the things you're talking about, even though I think you said this was seven years ago now are still so relevant and timely for folks today who are trying to get into cyber or trying to get their next job. So I just thought great advice and, and just wanted to highlight it. Absolutely. And one of the things I did when I went into the interviews, I had a plan on here are my gaps in my resume that I don't match with the application. But I had a plan like, here's what I'm doing to fill those gaps right now. And if you guys would be willing to send me to a boot camp or a SANS class, I know it's super expensive, but SANS classes are really great. Uh, I said, here's my wish list for training and development. And they were like, she, she knows, she knows what she needs to fill this gap, you know? So I think it, it takes a little bit of research and preparation, but if you really want the job, that's what it takes, especially in this field. I also think it's so important for potential managers, directors, uh, hiring folks listening to understand that when you look at a veteran, like you're looking at someone with the skill set that, you know, they put the mission first, they have the ability to go from zero to 100% in a position. Like you, you knew nothing about Chinese and they made you an, a, an intelligence analyst, you know, a linguist in one of the most difficult languages in the world. Um, so you have the capacity to learn like that's for every single veteran, right? Like we all went into a job that we had knew nothing about the military provided us with the training. We had to learn it. We had to pass and we had to become an efficient operator and, and a member of a team um, that had to complete a mission. And so I, when I look at a veteran um, who's trying to get into cybersecurity, oftentimes these managers will be looking for this like unicorn who has, you know, 80 years of experience, 10 years of experience, all the uh, certifications. It's like, give this guy a chance or give this gal a chance who is a veteran, because I know probably that, they're able to do the job just based on the mindset that they have. So I think Absolutely. your your experience highlights that, right? Absolutely. Reminds me of that Vince Lombardi quote about, I don't need Vince Lombardi, the great football coach. I don't need players who have the will to win. All players have the will to win. I need players who have the will to prepare to win. 
Yes. And I think Andy, that's what you're getting at, right? Is, is the ability to learn go zero to 60 in something like in the way charity spoke of in her background is so powerful and something hiring managers should really look for um, in veterans as a unique talent that they have developed. Absolutely. So you get this new job at this new company, getting into cyber. What was like when, when you just started out um, in cyber intelligence here, what was kind of like your day in the life of uh, a brand new cyber threat intelligence analyst? Oh my gosh. Um, there was a lot of training and development at the beginning. So I allocated a couple hours a day to certification, studying, um, and also just networking in the company. Like at that point, we were in person in a big office, very open space, and everyone was so open and friendly and helpful. So I would like, you know, put time on calendars to get to know people and ask them, like, what do you do in security? Like, what is your role here in this company? Um, what's your background? And I, I started learning a lot uh, from the vulnerability intelligence analyst. And um, we had one guy that was developing a new tool and he specializes in cryptography. And I was like, okay, this is way over my head, but can I can I take an hour of your time to just get you to explain what you do? And I sat next to a PhD in cybersecurity who was a retired Navy chief and we, we call him chief. Um, and, and to this day, he's still a friend and a mentor, but he really mentored me a lot. Uh, you know, when he wasn't writing algorithms on a whiteboard behind me, I'm like, so <laughs> can you explain <laughs> to me this? <laughs> It's a very basic thing. He he was just so helpful. So I spent a lot of time learning from the people around me, which I feel really set me up for a great foundation for understanding security as a whole. And it helped me with a security plus certification too. Um, but a day in the life of a CTI analyst, we were really um, building a, a CTI program at that time. We had access to a few platforms, a few vendors had provided us with some sources of intelligence. Um, uh, you know, one was dark web specific. So we were looking at uh, alerts and notifications about uh, our company and our customers that were exposed. Uh, you know, their data was exposed in the dark web or in the criminal underground at some point. Um, we also had access to recorded futures platform. Um, which is the company I currently work for. I, I cut my teeth on CTI with Recorded Future back then at the very beginning. Um, and I learned a lot in their platform about open source intelligence and just basically like, what can we find just using the internet? You know, there's so much out there that's exposed. Companies have um, digital footprints out there that they don't even know about. Um, and I always say that's because so many security organizations are focused internally at logs. What kind of attacks are we experiencing internally? What kind of malware is happening on our endpoints, you know, phishing and things like that, which is very important. Um, but there's another side and that's what's happening outside um, and where you can find out what threat actors are targeting your organization before they even launch that attack. Um, and, and I just fell in love with that because I wasn't really technical because I was very new. Um, and I'm not, honestly, I'm not great at math and science. So coding was a little difficult for me. Um, but I, I realized really quickly, I'm really good at research and investigations and I know how to use the internet. So it was just a, a matter of what can I find out there that can add value to this threat intelligence program. So a lot of it is going through those those sources that you have. Um, and, and when you see something, um, that's an anomaly or something that's, you know, obviously bad, like, okay, this mention of our employees should not be out there, or these passwords leaked in this database should not be out there. Um, that's where I really started digging in. And, and I realized really quickly, like I can, I can do this. And also, I can use my Chinese in dark web forums where the threat actors are using the Chinese language. Um, so really, I just used my past experience 
and kind of married that with what would add value to the organization and to the clients and kind of dug in there at the beginning. So another um, MOS or uh, military job that a lot of people have, which is more known is intelligence. So there's uh, Intel folks in all the different branches and that often will translate over. I, I know a lot of them who go over into cyber intelligence. And so I am in a group of Hmong veterans who are in information security and there's a lot of threat analysts there and they always talk about attribution. And the first time I got a call with them, that's all they talked about. And I was like, what is going on? What are you guys talking about? So I know it is something that's important in the intelligence field. Can you talk about basic at a very basic level for our listeners, what attribution is and how that ties into cyber threat intelligence? Yeah. Attribution is who did it. It's, Who's the threat actor? Who's the threat? If somebody breaks into my house and the police are like, hey, a burglar broke into your house while you were out or whatever, I'm like, who who did that? Who was it? Did you catch him on camera? Can you go find him? Can you arrest him? That's what we do in, in threat intelligence too. And it's not, it's not all about attribution because oftentimes with cybercrime, it doesn't matter as much who the cyber criminal was, it, it, especially if it's like, low hanging fruit kind of thing, you want to be able to like find out how do I stop them? How do I secure, let's say, let's go with the analogy of the house. How do I secure my home? So not only that one, that one burglar doesn't get in, but I don't want any burglars to be able to get in. So we're hardening our security around our home, setting up, you know, alarm systems. I've got I've got three dogs here, so nobody's breaking into my house. Uh, you know, like, how do we strengthen our security? But if you know that there's one burglar that's hitting all the houses in the neighborhood, that's when attribution is important. Same thing with, let's say, ransomware, for example. If one ransomware group has special tools and special access and they can hit all these different networks and companies, we want to know who they are so we can get to know them a little bit better, maybe sneak into their chats, maybe get into their website, uh, blend in with them, make them think we're one of, uh, you know, a, an affiliate that wants to be in business with them, find out how they do what they do so we can help defend the victims and and help protect them better. So that's, that's basically attribution. Um, but the reason it matters to me is because as a China specialist, I'm watching, you know, Chinese threat groups, um, especially state sponsored APTs or advanced persistent threat groups, the, you know, the government funded Monday through Friday, eight to five behind a keyboard warriors that are conducting major hacking campaigns and wreaking havoc all over the world. Very good. So I actually met somebody recently and he stood up his own internal threat intelligence team. Do you think that that is something that, you know, I guess where um, in your cybersecurity maturity as an organization, do you think that that will start bringing value where you might invest in like an FTE for a, a cyber threat intelligence analyst or, or even a team to do this full time for you? You know, I think every organization can benefit from threat intelligence. I know not all organizations can afford to stand up a team, so they'll buy threat intelligence from a vendor or get access to a platform. That way they only have to have, let's say, one threat intel person with all the sources that they need. Um, and maybe they'd rather pay for that threat intel on from those vendors to kind of take the pressure off that one analyst. Um, but what I've found, and I, I've stood up a couple of, well, I've helped stand up a couple of threat intel programs at big organizations. Um, and really it starts with the right people, the right tools, and honing in on the right processes that you need. And I always say that when your executives or your board or even other sections in your security organization need intelligence. Like they need to hone in 
on what's most valuable to them because right now they've just got so much coming at them. And let's say your vulnerability team, for example, they have all these different exploits happening all the time. They have to prioritize what they patch first. Just because a vulnerability is like a 10.0 doesn't mean that it's at the top of your list for your organization. You have to compare it, go, okay, it's being exploited in the wild right now, and we use it across our entire organization. So it's a, you know, it's a very high risk. A threat intel program can help feed the proper information to that team to help them prioritize what needs to be patched first. The executives, their job is to save money and stop the leak. Like there's a lot of data leaks, there's a lot of money flying out the window because of hacking activity and ransomware. So a threat intel program can help inform the executives on what, it, what are the highest risks to this company right now? What do we need to prioritize this quarter or this year? And then how can we grow and, and strengthen our security over the next few years? Threat intel programs can do that. So I always say if the executives really want the best information, the best prioritization for risk, they should have a threat intel team or program. I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, totally makes sense. So I've, I've worked internal security at a company before, and we are always bombarded with all the different things, different alerts that we have to triage, different programs that we're trying to stand up. And so it's usually very busy when, you know, there's geopolitical things that are happening or um, things that are, that are in the news. A lot of times, security teams don't have time to deal with it or even think about it. Um, I think a lot of times it's like, oh, there's some hacking going on in China, Russia, threat actors are, are ha- you know, hacking into different systems. We're too small of an organization. They're, they're never going to attack us. Um, we're, we're just hoping that, you know, oh, if they do attack us, we know that there's really nothing we can do. do you, how important do you think it is for, basically every organization to kind of pay attention to the geopolitical threats to these state sponsored actors um, instead of just kind of security through obscurity, basically. Uh, It 100%. It's more important now than it ever has been in the past. We have gotten to the point where our technology is so intertwined around the world that we come to these breaking points like what's happening with russia right now um since russia invaded ukraine we are witnessing this you know divorce of technology decoupling if you will between russia and the rest of the well us and europe and our allies um are really questioning should we be doing business with some of these oligarchs, with some of these politicians that are supporting the war in Ukraine. Um, And so because of that, and because of sanctions, which is key word, very important, um, because of sanctions on Russia and Russian entities and companies and executives, we are now forced to reconcile who we're doing business with. And so that decoupling process, it's happening with Russia now, it could happen with China in the future, which is my current research project that I'm doing right now is, uh, you know, what is the risk? What is the threat of a U.S.-China decoupling or, you know, China and anyone around the world, really? Um, so geopolitics plays a huge role in security right now. And it's not just, you know, APTs and, and state-sponsored threat groups attacking the U.S. and our allies. It's um, it's bigger than that. It's, it's, you know, uh, influence operations is what I specialize in now, Chinese influence operations specifically. And by influence operations, I mean disinformation, like malign influence. Um, and it's not always easy to detect. It doesn't always look political. Sometimes it's, you know, under the table um, diplomacy and, and deals happening around the world or China trying to create new partnerships in certain areas of the world where the U.S. is falling behind. 
um, gaining more global influence, um, which then sets them up for economic strength as well. So it, it's a competition and geopolitics plays a huge part. I mean, it is the foundation of everything that's happening. And, um, and so, you know, I encourage everyone to incorporate geopolitical intelligence into your security program. And a lot of people don't know where to start. Like, what, what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, my team, for example, is called Global Issues. And we are just solely focused on geopolitical intel. And we cover current events. We write risk analysis in those notes and in those, you know, uh, reports. Um, of course, those go out to all of our clients, but also we have a lot of on-demand requests for Intel from uh, corporations and governments around the world that are going, okay, what do we need to know about how COVID-19 is affecting Shanghai, China right now? Like what impact is that going to have on our business? Because Shanghai was in lockdown. I mean, maybe it still is right now, but very much like shut down. China is having a surge in COVID. North Korea is having a, a surge in COVID. They just admitted, um, mm -hmm. which is surprising. Um, but, you know, like what's happening with the Philippines election and what do we need to know about this new uh, president that was just elected and what impact is that going to have on our business doing business in the Philippines. So um, variety of topics to cover for Geopol Intel, but very, very, very key to um, keep your, your board, your executives, your CISO informed about what's happening around the world and how that will impact security. So you, you work for Recorded Future now, and how could uh, like a company like Recorded Future, like a vendor, um, offset maybe uh, having an internal threat team if if you can't uh, in afford or have the expertise internally to do threat intelligence, or maybe even don't have the time to do it. How can mm -hmm. getting a vendor like Recorded Future help? bolster your your threat intelligence and, and what can that provide to you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, even as a, a client, I, I used to be a client of all these different vendors. I just found it really fascinating, which is probably why I took the jump over to this side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's really important to work for an organization, protect that organization. You get to know that organization intimately and, and how to protect it. Um, but the vendors have a, like a eagle eye view like we, we get to look down at all these different organizations and find the patterns of how threat actors are targeting certain organizations and certain industries and certain countries around the world um for example most vendors have uh, a team that does threat hunting and they're looking at network traffic um and doing analysis on network traffic and in finding the patterns that advanced persistent threat groups are are, are doing, like uh, what kind of malware do they use? What kind of tools do they use? Um, you know, looking at the kill chain, like how are they getting initial access all the way down to infection and, and, and you know, what are their ultimate objectives? So your the teams that vendors have are very specified, like they're very specialized is the word I'm looking for. Um, you've got threat hunters, you've got geopolitical experts, we've got academics and people from think tanks and people with backgrounds in the agencies, um, all working towards protecting um, the customers. And as a client, you get access to all of that different data, the reports that we write up on, you know, malware analysis or uh, like, for instance, I, I write a lot about what China's propaganda system is putting out to the world and how they're trying to influence the world towards certain things that are friendly to China. Um, and so you get the benefit of all these experts through one platform. You log in, you've got it tailored to your organization, you've got it tailored to what you need to know, your dashboard is set up for you and your team. 
So every morning when you log in, you can see your alerts, you can see what is prioritized based on risk score, and then you can go through and do a little bit of due diligence on those notifications, and you've got all those experts that can help you in the background. So you're not, you're never alone, which is great. That's what I loved uh, when I was a client too, is I always felt like I had a team to help me with the things that I didn't know. Like, I didn't know what I was looking for at the be- at the beginning, and they were like, why don't we start with these priorities? And and that ties into intelligence requirements. Like if you work in the military or for a government agency, you may be familiar with intelligence requirements, which I call priorities. I say it's, you know, three to five priorities that you want to focus on for your intelligence program. Let's say you want to know about any Uh, company data or employee data or client data that's leaked in dark web. And you want to be able to remediate that and get that taken care of and cleaned up or figure out who's exposed so you can reset passwords and accounts or something like that. Um, That would be one priority. So intelligence requirements are really important. And a lot of times young, um, new security programs and, and young Um, you know, brand new CTI teams are not really sure where to start. And a lot of times the vendors can help guide you. Like, here's what a lot of other people in your industry are focused on. Maybe you should start there, see how it works for you, and then readjust in six months. So it's just, it's amazing. It's like having an army of people um, helping you focus in on what's most relevant. Like if you're a healthcare company and healthcare companies were getting attacked during the COVID era, right? That may be a requirement that that you would want to know about. Absolutely. You know, we had uh, vaccine makers that said, hey, we we need to know um, what disinformation is being spread on purpose about vaccines and how we can remediate that. How can we counter that disinformation in order to protect people? So any final advice for companies if they don't have a threat intelligence program? Like, how do you get started? Like, what's what's the basic step? If maybe you can go out to a vendor or maybe you can hire someone like you, but if, if they didn't have that type of resource, um, maybe where's like a, a basic area that they can just start with? Yeah, I always say like, if you have a budget for threat intelligence, which I highly recommend you fight for, um, but if the board or the executives are just, nope, we don't have the money for it, then hire a couple of people to do with free open source tools. Threat intelligence analysts are very resourceful, and there's a lot out there that is available through free open sources. It will at least give you a head start. It will give you somewhere to start with your intelligence requirements to help inform your teams internally. And um, there are a lot of great resources that us vendors offer for free. We have resources pages on our websites where we put free reports. Um, Shameless plug, I have a report coming out on Monday. Um, I I wrote a new framework for analyzing influence operations, which I hope will help analysts all over the world that are uh, getting these intel requirements from their bosses or saying, we need to know more about how disinformation or state-sponsored influence ops are affecting our company, this framework should help. Um, but to say that is that the vendors have tons of free resources. You just have to know where to look, go to their websites, follow those experts on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, attend the webinars, and just learn because there's so much out there that's free and available Um, and actually you can start uh, a dark web team that is experienced with the criminal underground and knows where to go and has access to that too. Now, if you do have a budget, reach out to the top vendors, if they're not already reaching out to you, which they probably are, um, and, and explore, do some comparing, do some free demos, Um, you know, just explore what they can offer you and who's the best fit for your organization. Awesome. Anything else, Adam? I really enjoyed that last kind of conversation around 
when vendors are going to particularly make a difference. And I almost relate it to because it's like the canonical example of where software as a service really became valuable. Let's take exchange server as an example, right? There are only so many great exchange admins in the world. And, and the fact is they couldn't all be dispersed across all of these different companies. But if you could consolidate that into a consolidated footprint and get, five, 10 of the best exchange admins in the world to run an environment that almost anybody else could just pay for and use. Now everyone has a world-class exchange environment and they just pay for what they use, you know, as an example with Office 365. And so I'm always a big fan of the idea that there are always going to be a finite number of experts in a field in the world. And if we can take their work product and we can scale it, across our industry or across many industries, that's a powerful delivery mechanism. So while I encourage orgs to staff up in cybersecurity in ways that are meaningfully different for their organization, there are opportunities to work with organizations like Recorded Future where they have expertise that, to be honest, your org probably can never hire at that level. And so you can take advantage of that instead of trying to recreate it. And I think that's how we get better at cybersecurity in general is we used to have all of these siloed fiefdoms across all of these enterprises of the world. And we're starting to share more and more. We're seeing this. Have you looked at this hash? Have you seen this attack before? Have you seen these techniques before? And the better we get at sharing that information and raising our hand and say, hey, yeah, we had that happen here, the better off we're all going to be. If you look at early days of solar winds, one of the things that was really helpful, and I forget who was one of the initial companies to raise their hand, I think it was FireEye, came out and was very open about, we saw this, we saw this, we saw that. More of that, please, because that's what makes us all better. And so I love the idea of really scaling expertise as much as possible instead of trying to recreate expertise. Yes. And I wanted to add on that, that it used to be that the government agencies had all the intel. And now we have so much through open source that the private sector is really flourishing because we move very quickly compared to like the bigger, clunkier agencies. Um, You know, they kind of move a little slower and they have a lot of bureaucracy to deal with. In the private sector, we can move very quickly, which means we get the intel out faster. And so the government agencies are clients because they also want that intel at that speed. Um, And I saw an announcement today that President Biden is working on uh, some initiative to help create some... Um, guidelines and frameworks around open source sharing to make it easier. And the government, um, you know, during the Russia, you know, war in Ukraine, uh, the U.S. government has been very open and transparent about some of the intel that we've been sharing with Ukraine, um, the U.S. I mean, and um, and I think that that openness has really, really helped. It has helped the private sector. It's helping organizations like, you know, corporations and enterprises protect themselves. Um, and then the government is going, okay, like this, this is worth sharing. If, if the benefit is it's going to help, you know, thousands or millions of companies, then we need to share it out. And I think that's been such a great thing. But I just love working in the private sector now because um, we do move very quickly. We find it, we write it into a note, we get it in that platform, our clients get it first. And then down the road, we, you know, uh, put it out in public blogs, too, so that the general public can learn from it, too. That's, I just love it. (laughs) Well, Charity, it has been a pleasure uh, talking with you tonight. This conversation has been enlightening. I have learned a lot. I know Adam probably has learned a lot too, and hopefully our listeners oh, yeah. uh, will take away something from this to help bolster maybe a fledgling uh, threat intelligence program at their company. I know that you're on Twitter, on LinkedIn as well, um, so we can uh, have our listeners find you if they have questions. And that's our show for this week. So thank you so our much. Contact Im- thank you. Absolutely. 
So Adam and, and my contact information will be in the show notes for our listeners. If they have any questions or comments, if you guys want to reach out to us, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.